All right, Annabelle, I'm going to get started just to let you know. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bonnie McDonald, and I'm the president and CEO of Landmarks Illinois. And I'm so pleased to welcome you to our November Snapshots Lecture Series. And we have a wonderful presentation for you today, um, all about the cultural heritage and preservation work in San Antonio. And I'm excited to introduce you in a few moments to our speakers and to hear from them about their incredible work. Before we do that, I just have a few uh, housekeeping items for you. Uh, so uh, many of us are familiar with Zoom at this point, but just in case you're not, I wanna call your attention to the bottom of your screen. And if you take your cursor, your mouse, and you hover it over the bottom of your screen, you'll get that black bar, that band of icons. Um, so today we're going to be accepting your questions and in the question and answer section. So if you have a question for our, our speakers today, all you have to do is click on that Q&A button and type in your question. It will come to me. And then at the end of the presentation, I will filter those questions uh, to our presenters. Feel free to do that throughout the presentation. I will collect your questions. And then again, at the very end, when we have about 15 minutes for the question and answer period, I will uh, put that to our speakers. Um, so we do not have a chat button. So anything that you have, if you have questions, just put it in the Q&A and it, I'll be monitoring that throughout the presentation today. I also want to let you know that we're so proud uh, to be able to offer for the first time closed captioning today in, uh, in Spanish. So we welcome uh, uh, people who are not native English speakers, people who are native Spanish speakers to our presentation today. And we're happy to welcome um, uh, Annabelle Fernandez, who is helping us with the closed captioning translation. So if you would like to uh, participate or see that closed captioning today, all you do is go back down to, the, uh, to that black bar I told you about the bottom of your screen. You click on the icon for closed captioning and then show subtitles. So if you'd like to see that today, participate, you are more than welcome. Um, this is our effort to increasingly make our programs and preservation uh, more equitable, more inclusive and accessible to all people um, who are living in our communities. So once again, just to say welcome everyone. Um, and on behalf of my team at Landmarks Illinois and the board of directors, we're so happy to have you at the Snapshot Lecture Series. We have these about six times a year and our next one we'll be planning for the spring. So um, we'll let you know as that comes forward in the e-blast that we have. If you are um, not a member of Landmarks Illinois, I just wanna let you know that you have the opportunity to participate in our work um, for free in many uh, cases with our free e-newsletter. You can go to our website, landmarks.org and sign up for our um, e-blasts at the bottom of our homepage. Uh, again, that's landmarks.org. You can also engage with us on social media. Uh, we have you know, everything, of course, from a Twitter feed and um, Facebook to Instagram and also a uh, YouTube page. And I'll reference the YouTube page in a moment. You can also become a member and support the work that we do, bringing wonderful speakers um, to, you know, to our community, as well as the work we do helping people save places for people. Our memberships uh, start at $35 a year. Um, we, you know, we really appreciate everyone who's here today with us that is a member and supports our work on a daily basis. And we hope that you are compelled to do so after you, know, after you participate in our programs. Uh, but also, if you feel like uh, membership is not for you, you can also make a donation to Landmarks Illinois at our website, landmarks.org. I also hope that you were able to participate in our recent virtual uh, awards program. Our annual Richard H. Driehaus Foundation Preservation Awards took place on October 21st in a virtual platform. And we're so proud to present the accomplishments of people and the places that they have saved, the places that matter to them all across the state of Illinois. We did that, as I said, through a virtual program that featured these compelling videos of our um, of the people and their and their places as well, and you can actually see those again. So if you missed it or you want to see it again, you can actually go to our YouTube channel. Uh, each one of the videos is up there independently, as well as the full awards program. If you would like to watch that in its entirety, um, it was only an hour, so it's not a lot of Zoom time. I promise. 
Um, we also want to just give you a, a little advance notice that we have coming up in January, the annual Skyline Council Trivia Night, which is always a sellout. It's going to be virtual this year, uh, but we did test the trivia night virtually a few months ago, and it was a big hit. Um, Gregory Dowell of the uh, Skyline Council always puts on a great trivia night, and I would encourage you to keep a lookout through our e-blasts, through our social media about the trivia night coming up in January. So um, hope you'll participate in those. Uh, let, me, let me tell you again about today's lecture that we're, we're so excited to present this because we've actually been working to bring you this information uh, for about a year now. We've had conversations about engaging our speakers uh, to come and talk with us. So we're so happy that we can make this happen virtually today. And so we're excited to share with you uh, the work that's happening in cultural heritage and making preservation inclusive in the city of San Antonio. And you might wonder, why are we talking about San Antonio when we're in Chicago? It's because we have many of the, you know, the same, um, you know, the same opportunities to include more people in preservation here in Chicago, just as they have done in San Antonio. So we're proud to welcome our two speakers today. Our first speaker will be Sarah Zaneda Gould, and our second speaker will be Shannon Shea Miller. I'm going to introduce Ms. Gould right now, and she's going to speak first, and then we'll take a break. I'll introduce um, uh, Ms. Miller, and then she will take the podium next, the virtual podium, and then we'll have our Q&A at the very end. So I'm happy to introduce uh, Sarah Zaneda Gould. Um, she is working with um, and actually has a leadership role with the organization Latinos in Heritage Conservation and also uh, San Antonio's West Side Preservation Alliance. Uh, so she is going to share the accomplishments, the, the, um, you know, the opportunities that have been forged um, to engage more people on the West Side of San Antonio in the work of preserving places that matter to them. Um, so she has really helped to increase Latinx representation in historic preservation and also increase the understanding about how heritage conservation is an integral part of preservation. Um, she also has made a wonderful point nationwide in presentations about how cultural heritage uh, and uh, conservation of that heritage is a social justice imperative. Now she's going to address some of the policy changes that she's identified that would help increase diversity in historic preservation and also improve engagement with the Latinx community. Um, later, uh, Shannon Shea Miller will be talking about uh, the city of San Antonio's innovative work to put forward how um, preservation and the living trades can, uh, I think, can be brought to the public and how the living trades continue to have a place in historic preservation, as well as her work in cultural heritage, heritage conservation, and also including preservation as part of uh, climate change action. So first, uh, to introduce you to Sarah Zaneda Gould, she is the Interim Executive Director of the Mexican American Civil Rights Initiative. Um, that is a national project to collect and disseminate Mexican American civil rights history. Uh, and she's a longtime museum worker and a public historian, and she's curated over a dozen exhibits about history, art, and culture. Now, Sarah was formerly the founding director of Museo del West Side and lead curatorial researcher at the Institute of Texas Culture. Uh, Ms. Gould is the co-founder and she's still a, a co-director of Latinos in Heritage Conservation. Um, and we're actually proud uh, locally to have Ed Torres, some of you know Ed Torres from Bauer Latosa Studio, who is on the board of Latinos in Heritage Conservation. Now, additionally, she serves on the boards of El Camino Real de los Tejos National Historic Trail Association and the Friends of the Texas Historical Commission. She's on the Council of the American Association of State and Local History, and she's also an active member of the West Side Preservation Alliance, which again is a coalition dedicated to promoting and preserving the working class architecture of San Antonio's West Side. I wonder, Sarah, where you find where time to do anything else. So that's a, that's a lot of engagement on your part. We're so excited to welcome you and to hear more about this work. So uh, to Sarah Zanetti Gould, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I, um, I, I do just, you know, want to offer full disclosure that I'm not a trained historic preservationist. This is something that I kind of came into um, almost accidentally. So um, 
uh, just just wanted to frame it that way for you. Um, I um, I am based in San Antonio, uh, where I'm a public historian, and where we're so fortunate that in this city, just about every corner has some kind of, of rich history. And um, my career as a public historian has largely been about um, thinking about abolishing uh, gatekeepers and making history accessible to all people and, and also making history meaningful uh, to all people. So when I moved to San Antonio about 10 years ago, I started doing some community history work and came to the realization that one of the challenges here, and of course we all know it's not just a San Antonio problem, uh, but one of the challenges in a, in a lot of places where folks are doing work in communities of color is that historic preservation is not um, well recognized within communities of color. That doesn't mean people aren't doing it, but they maybe don't have the same access to the tools or the language of historic preservation and heritage conservation. And, um, and so um, one of the things that, that I became aware of within a year or two of living here was that there were some um, policies and practices in place that did seem to um, sort of have blinders to some of, of the really rich history in places like the West Side, um, places that are majority Mexican-American and also incredibly working class. Um, this whole city is pretty much a working class city. So um, that in and of itself, I think is a, a, a preservation challenge, um, but it's particularly a challenge in communities of color. So um, today I'm just gonna talk about um, the work of uh, Latinos in Heritage Conservation and the Westside Preservation Alliance, uh, things that we're doing at national and local levels respectively to increase Latino representation in historic preservation and um, increased understanding of heritage conservation as a, a social justice imperative, as Bonnie mentioned. From there, I'll, look, I'll highlight just a couple of local case studies, um, including some challenges and successes, and then I'll make a few um, recommendations for improving engagement with underrepresented communities and increasing equity in historic preservation. So um, what you see right uh, there is um, some photos from Latinos in Heritage Conservation, which is a national organization that I helped co-found in 2014. Um, among us, so we had been fortunate to get connected through just a network of um, people who had been doing preservation projects in Latino communities. Uh, what we recognized was that people, whether individuals or groups, have been hard at work doing Latino historic preservation projects for decades, but that a lot of that work wasn't uh, recognized. And so oftentimes people would even tell you, we didn't know anybody was doing this work. Um, so um, one of the things that we wanted to do was figure out a way to connect people working in different places on similar projects and basically create a national network, um, something to serve as a platform for raising visibility of our work um, and, uh, and raising visibility of the need for Latino historic preservation. And, um, and so what we have been doing for the last six years is participating in uh, various conferences, including having our own biannual conference. Our next one is actually uh, next year, September 2021 in Denver. And I will share more about that at the end of the presentation. Um, you can always find out more about what we're doing on our Facebook page too. Um, one thing that I really do wanna emphasize is that preservation work in communities of color is not new or even rare. Um, it's just often not recognized. And sometimes it happens outside of, or even in conflict with mainstream historic preservationists and historic preservation officials. So I think it's just really critical to remember that the modern preservation movement originated in the 1960s. So emerging in the context of the civil rights movement, emerging in the context of the early stages of the environmental movement, emerging in the context of um, multiple efforts to ensure greater social and cultural equity, um, such as the creation of uh, ethnic studies in universities. And so all of these things are overlapping, of course, with things like urban renewal and, um, and, and forced removals that devastated communities of color. Um, 
here you see Aurora Vargas um, being dragged out of her home, um, evicted uh, so that this neighborhood Chavez Ravine could be demolished to make way for uh, the Dodger Stadium that's there now, um, famous case. But this is the sort of thing that you see in communities of color uh, throughout the urban renewal period. Here in San Antonio, we also had our demolitions to urban renewal in the 60s and 70s. Um, but most recently, the Westside Preservation Alliance came out of efforts to save historic uh, properties in the West Side, especially this was the sort of the catalyst moment, the loss of the building La Gloria. Um, so again, uh, uh, San Antonio, predominantly working class, um, also majority Mexican American city. Um, La Gloria was a uh, Mexican American owned gas station, bakery and rooftop dance hall that was demolished despite community uh, opposition and despite the city's historic design and review commission, that's our preservation boards, unanimous vote to um, designate it historic in September of 2001. But from, from there, from the preservation board, it went to zoning, zoning said no, um, they, they called it an eyesore, uh, and then it went to city council and they also said no. Um, and so um, the building did fall to the wrecking ball, but in the process of falling to the wrecking ball, it really be, um, became cemented in the minds of um, local Mexican Americans as this, this icon of um, not only an icon of our past, but an icon of, of a past that was stolen from us. So here you can see three different um, paintings of um, La Gloria in the West Side. Of course, we've also lost, um, I'm sorry, we've also had some successes. So after La Gloria, the WPA comes into existence, the Westside Preservation Alliance, and multiple um, efforts to save buildings were successful and, and continued, we've continued to save things. Um, uh, Casa Maldonado on your left, La Hermas Nightclub on your right, the longest running Conjunto Nightclub, which is a particular style of music native to South Texas. Um, but then we've also lost some things. Um, we lost the nation's first full-time Spanish language television station. It was the first Univision station. Um, that's an architectural rendering there for you, as well as the founder, um, Bravo Cortez. Um, in May, 2013, um, a development company submitted an application to construct a 350 unit apartment complex in the very same location of this building, which was up for sale. Um, and conceptual plans were pretty quickly approved. Um, multiple entities, the Westside Preservation Alliance, the San Antonio Conservation Society, even the Texas Historical Commission, which is our SHPO, um, argued that the history of the building, the birthplace of Spanish language television in the US was worth saving. And um, what happened was that um, uh, by the San Antonio Office of Historic Preservation's own words, this is their recommendation, um, that they said, you know, the building meets the criteria for historic designation, but they recommended that the building not be saved and that instead the HDRC, or that's our preservation board, should weigh the architectural significance of the building and its cultural interpretation against the proposed development. And so the building, um, the first picture that you see there of the, um, the bulldozer, that one was, a, um, I think before the actual permit was, um, uh, the demolition permit was issued. And so there was a, a stay of order and, um, and then there was actually um, uh, some members of the Westside Preservation Alliance who climbed over the fence to try to stop the bulldozers and they all got arrested, um, but not charged. <laughs> they had to spend the night though in county jail. And, um, and so anyway, the building came down and what the sort of compromise was, was that the new apartment complex would have these um, historic markers on the exterior explaining the history of what was formerly there. Um, and I wanna just say, these pictures are old. Um, the first picture on the left is from when they first installed them. So you can see the plants are really tiny. At some point, the plants got really big. And so I actually think they have ripped them out at this point. Um, and I just haven't been back to take more photos. Um, other things, um, we actually worked um, with uh, the Office of Historic Preservation uh, in 2012, 2013 to do a big survey of historic resources on the west side. We were able to get several dozen buildings designated and that was really exciting, including uh, the Malt House, which was designated in 2013. Um, and unfortunately this building really, the, I'm sorry, the owners fell onto hard times 
and they needed to sell the building and a um, potential buyer showed up, said, I'll buy it, but with the intent to tear down the building to build a 7-Eleven. Um, the community protested, but you know, again, um, uh, the building came down. Um, and this is another interesting compromise situation um, where um, some of the sort of accessories that were particularly notable from the original building were put onto the 7-Eleven. And it was almost funny that when they were building the 7-Eleven and they were putting this malt house sign on the building, people on Facebook were saying the malt house is reopening. Um, but of course that wasn't really true. <laughs> um, most recently, this was just last year, um, I know I attempted to um, get this building designated, the former Valencia grocery store, um, which um, was um, a grocery store started by Antonio Valencia, an immigrant from Mexico. Um, in this particular spot of the West Side, this was one of the most racially diverse little areas here. So San Antonio was legally segregated, but the West Side never had any racial deed restrictions. This neighborhood was black, brown, white. Um, and so he started this grocery store there. He was able to grow wealth through this grocery store, um, including a, a big expansion of the building in 1926. He used that money to start sports teams for Mexican Americans because of segregation, Mexican Americans couldn't play with other people. So he used that money to start sports teams and also social clubs, including uh, Patio Andaluz, which is a sort of a storied nightclub here in San Antonio where uh, Chicano rock and roll really got its start in the 50s and 60s. Um, unfortunately, the building did um, come down. And you know, for me, uh, I, I have always appreciated um, OHP's willingness to listen to me even when I'm complaining. So I appreciate that, Shannon. Um, and also HDRC, the, the Preservation Board. But you know, one of the things that came out in, in this Preservation uh, Commission meeting was that one of the um, commissioners said he would understand the case it were, if it were based on the building's architecture. But because my application was based on uh, the cultural history, he was at a loss. And of course, our own city policy says that these things are, are all equal. Um, so I do think that there's a lot to, to have to do around education, right? Even education of people who probably should know better because this was an architecture professor, right? Who said that. Um, but at the WPA, we understand that we have so much work to do within our own community around what we call consciousness raising or that sort of education about why historic preservation should matter to us. And I think sometimes even the professionals need that too uh, when it comes to, to communities of color. Um, this last, uh, I'm sorry, almost next slide, almost last slide. Uh, gentrification is the, one of the biggest threats to communities like the West Side and also other communities of color, like uh, I know Pelson is experiencing something like this. We were recently able to get our community's oldest and largest public housing development on the National Trust's 11 most endangered list. This is the Alizana Apache Courts. They were designed by one of San Antonio's most important mid-century architects, Nathan strauss -Nafak. Um, And this, this housing development helped usher in basic infrastructure like sewer systems, which the West Side did not have prior to this. Uh, this was built in 3940. And, um, and um, unfortunately, just last month, last, I'm sorry, just last week, the owners, it's the nonprofit owners of this property, their board voted to approve demolition of these buildings. So of course, we are devastated about this. And we're particularly devastated about the massive displacement of people that we anticipate is going to happen from this. We have over 500 families living there right now. So I do wanna wrap up and not take up uh, too much time, but um, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble making this go forward. Oh, there we go. Um, I do just wanna conclude with a quote from Sarah Chavez, which if you've seen me speak before, I, I say this a lot, but it's a good one. Um, and that's that the fight is never about grapes or lettuce. It's always about the people. And I think that the very same thing is true about historic preservation. It's never about just the buildings, it's about the people. Um, and it's also for us very much about belonging um, and being recognized. Um, so we currently find that decision makers um, often deny applications for landmark designation due to um, so-called insufficient evidence or lack of building integrity, as in there have been too many modifications. Um, or uh, through a privileging of architectural significance over cultural significance. So I really feel like those are areas that we could explore 
um, bolstering either policies or practices around. Um, I want to make sure that people understand that there are real consequences, and I, I think all of you know this, but there are real consequences to the lack of um, kind of a broad cultural understanding on preservation boards. You know, there's the loss of history. There's the loss of, particularly in low income communities, there's a loss of an avenue for wealth accumulation. When we lose our historic buildings, we lose that opportunity to one day fix those houses up and, and pass that on to our kids. Um, and in an alarming number of cases, what we see is removal, displacement and erasure of people when our older buildings come down and, and it has a lot to do with gentrification. Um, so what can you do? I really wanna see more people of color on preservation boards. Um, and certainly if you, if you are already on a preservation board and you're not a person of color by no means, I'm not saying you need to resign or anything like that, but bring us to the table, help us help, let us help you make decisions, but also pay us for our expertise. Um, and, um, and then I just wanna conclude by inviting you to Congresso 2021 um, next fall in Denver. Thank you. Sarah, thank you so much. That was a, I think a compelling presentation about what we can do to number one, recognize uh, the significance of cultural heritage. And also I'm so glad that you brought up the, the challenging I think the challenging aspect of our integrity criteria, which is being discussed nationwide right now, there was just a very um, heated debate about that at the Pass Forward Conference, uh, the National Trust Conference recently. Uh, so I'm glad you brought that up. And I'm, maybe Shannon is going to talk about that as well. So as I said, we're, uh, we're so proud to be able to, to feature the voices of the, you know, these two national leaders today, these two you know, women national leaders. And uh, so our second speaker today is uh, also a, a leader in her field. So I'm proud to introduce uh, Shannon Shane Miller as well as Shannon gets her PowerPoint uh, put together. I'm just going to give you some of her background. Um, so Shannon is the director um, and historic preservation officer for the city of San Antonio's um, historic preservation department. That it's the Office of Historic Preservation, otherwise known as OHP. Um, and she became the, the director and the officer there in 2008. And I can tell you since then, uh, she, you know, she has been a change maker in preservation nationwide with her efforts in San Antonio, as well as in her volunteer work um, elsewhere. It's actually not in her bio, but she has been the president of the board, uh, the chair of the board of preservation action, our national uh, lobbying organization, our 501c4 organization, and made an incredible impact there in addition to her work nationwide. And uh, though she, she's not recognized here in her bio as well, one of Shannon's contributions is also arranging for monthly communications between historic preservation officers nationwide um, to connect them in, in cities across the country to ensure that they're sharing best practices. Um, so under Shannon's leadership, though, going back to her, uh, you know, her work at OHP, the Office of Historic Preservation, um, they've truly implemented an award-winning uh, program that includes extensive education and outreach, uh, technical training, as well as uh, comprehensive designation initiatives. Sarah just mentioned the work to survey the West Side, um, so that has been one of them. Uh, she's also done design and development review innovations and the city's vacant building program. Uh, Shannon has worked with a volunteer committee uh, in 2012 to form the Power of Preservation Foundation, otherwise known as POP. Um, and what POP does is it hosts an annual prom fundraising event, which raises funds uh, for a hands-on program that the OHP does um, called Students Together Achieving Revitalization, otherwise known as STAR, um, which uh, includes window restoration workshops, Rehabarama, which is Rehabarama, which is one of the best named programs in the country, and also a learning lab for trades education. So again, uh, Shannon is also a member of of the American Institute of Certified Planners, just to say she has a planning and preservation background. And I'm so pleased to introduce Shannon and, um, and ask for her wisdom about what we can do in Chicago. So Shannon, welcome. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm unmuted, right? You can hear me? Yes, okay. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here with you all today. I wish that I could be there in real life, but um, maybe someday, hopefully. Um, 
I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the Office of Historic Preservation's work and really focusing on um, issues, the fact that, you know, our, our profession is really changing. I mean, issues such as climate change and social and racial justice and equity and inclusion and even the pandemic. I mean, all of these things are making us kind of rethink our practice and approach and our standards and regulations, I think, for the better. Um, we have, we still have, you know, we have progress that needs to be made, of course. Um, and then in making sure that we're really making room for intangible heritage and cultural heritage and thinking beyond just architecture, as, as Sarah mentioned. Um, the mission of the Office of Historic Preservation is to safeguard cultural, economic, and environmental sustainability and preserve the unique sense of place and economic competitiveness and authenticity in San Antonio. And we do that through so many things that I'm going to try to buzz through um, without overwhelming you. Just to give you a very brief background, the department was actually created as a separate standalone department in 2008. Um, we're one of the largest, obviously Chicago is as well, municipal uh, offices, we have 20 full-time employees. Um, we are the number one in the state of Texas. We do one third of all the certificate of appropriate re reviews in the whole state. So the design, the volume of design review is very high. Um, and then we spend a lot of time doing education and outreach type activities. Um, we have six basic program areas that you see here on the screen. Unfortunately, time is not going to allow me to get into archaeology much or, or the vacant building program, but I will touch on the other four. Um, our design review program, we have 32 local historic districts with one pending, um, 1,600 individual landmarks. We also review a lot of other types of properties that are not just historic. Um, so we review all downtown properties, all public projects like new airport terminals and libraries and fire stations also come through the same commission. Um, the office also reviews every demolition permit reviewed by the city. So uh, many of those are not historic and they can be released immediately, but that gives us an opportunity to identify properties that may not have been previously identified um, for potential designation. Um, <clears throat> we also feel very, I mean, I feel very strongly that if, if we're going to have these rules and regulations for property owners to follow that we need to be a resource to them, we need to try to make the process as, as clear and consistent and predictable as, pro as possible. And if we do this and we make it affordable and it's efficient, then it also encourages people to do work with approval versus doing something and asking for forgiveness later. Um, unfortunately, oftentimes, um, city process may feel like this to people, and we try to do everything that we can to avoid that. It's very easy to get bogged down in our work, and we have a huge caseload, and so you forget to call the applicant and tell them what your rec is going to be. But that is something we um, place a lot of importance on in our office, is making sure that we're up, up front with customers. Um, you know, think, thinking about coming to the commission meeting is scary for a lot of people. They've never done that. They're not accustomed to speaking in public. So really trying to, to hold their hand and tell them what to expect um, and just make sure that, that people feel um, supported and have the resources that they need to be successful in the process. Um, also, uh, on along that same line, um, we, we feel it's important to make sure that our process is as equitable as, as possible for people. And so trying to provide opportunities for staff consultation, um, we have a design review committee where they can meet in advance with commissioners. So that sometimes helps to alleviate anxiety about what the process is gonna be like. And then we also have a design assistance program. You'll see on the screen a couple of examples where um, we've worked with local architects that then hire um, students as interns, like um, College of Architecture students as interns. And then they help applicants who don't have the resources available to um, develop drawings for their proposal. And you can see on from the left to the right that they they just get more clear in terms of what they're asking for approval from the commission. And the thing that's really great about this is obviously it helps applicants that don't have the resources to hire someone, but it's also a fantastic experience for the students. Um, I, our next program area that I want to touch on is our Scout SA program area, and that is really our comprehensive survey and designation initiative. And the idea behind the Scout SA kind of logo, as you can see, is that we want it to be about 
the community identifying what's important. Get out, explore the city, discover new places, and then really celebrating those things. And so we work to engage the public, utilizing technology for crowdsourcing. Um, Sarah mentioned uh, the Westside Cultural Resources Survey that we did um, in starting 2011, 2012 timeframe, and really we're able to develop several phases of designations with the community, um, which is a great model, I think, for um, other similar initiatives. Um, and then I think I mentioned already that we do review all demolition permits in the city. So that is a function that, you know, the Scout SA team will kind of take a look and is we send it out to the community and try to get feedback before it's too late and the, and the property is gone. Um, another thing that Sarah mentioned that, that I, I suspected she might is the issue related to, to criteria for designation. And um, the thing that's interesting in, in San Antonio is that for, for a long time, actually, we've had the ability to designate based on cultural significance. The way our ordinance is written is we have 16 criteria and it must meet at least three criteria in order to be um, eligible for designation. And seven of our criteria include cultural significance in some way. So it's really not a matter of not being able to justify designation. It is oftentimes, as, as Sarah mentioned, a, an education issue with uh, appointed and elected officials who ultimately have to have to vote to approve these designations. Um, our other program area that I want to talk a little bit more in depth about is our Living Heritage Initiative. Um, we do have a cultural historian on staff, Claudia Guerra, and um, Claudia's charge is well, many fold, she, but um, but really ensuring that like cultural history and intangible heritage are included in our processes and programs. Oops, it just changed by itself. Um, sorry, it just changed by itself. So I'm just trying to get it back to normal. Um, so one of the one of the programs that we have are. Um, kind of new mess methods of recognition and engagement. So we have a couple of neighborhoods where um, they maybe either are not interested in or possibly even not eligible for um, historic district designation, but they want to be recognized and they want to celebrate that cultural heritage. And so we've, I, we've developed this um, cultural heritage districts that is largely honorary, but it enables them to kind of celebrate and it also gives them, like I mentioned that we do design re uh, demolition review. And so if you're in a cultural heritage district, then you're notified when demolitions come in. And so it just kind of gives a little bit more public engagement in those neighborhoods. Um, we also launched the Living Heritage Symposium and we've held um, three, I believe. And um, the idea behind the symposium was really about thinking about how to one, like leverage living heritage in our community for economic prosperity of, of our community members. But then also one of the projects, like Sarah mentioned the Malt House, which is a fantastic example. And one of the things that really kind of launched the Living Heritage Symposium concept is we can designate things for cultural significance, but then what? Sometimes it's not always obvious because a lot of preservation practice and design guidelines and commissioners training and, and um, kind of frame of reference is architectural. And so when the significance is not something that you see, how do you do, how do you tackle that? How do you write design guidelines for that? How do you really go through that um, review process when, when what you're saving in the first place was not the architecture? Um, we also, through the Living Heritage Symposium, um, launched a legacy business program, which is also a, a kind of honorary uh, way to promote businesses, receive recognition. Um, we help to provide resources, small business development in, uh, assistance and things like that, and then also connect them to other resources and potential, potentially financial. Um, but it's really just a way to, to highlight the importance that these legacy and family businesses have in our community. Um, Claudia also does a lot of work related to cultural mapping and oral history collection. And, you know, obviously we think of maps that tell you like where you are, how do you get someplace, but they also can say like who we are and what, you know, they reflect like sort of memory and relationship to places and, and things like that that are not, that are sometimes 
stories or language or um, intangible kind of cultural assets that you don't think of traditionally being on a map. Um, we've also launched uh, another, a new initiative, relatively new initiative to identify shotgun houses around the community. Um, we've worked with community partners such as the WPA to identify over 200 um, shotgun houses. And really, you know, the idea behind the initiative is that shotguns are a great example. They're affordable, they're kind of climate ready, there's embodied energy there, they're culturally sustainable. And so the idea really is to, is to promote this as a building type. And then we're working with a council office to launch um, some example rehabilitation projects of shotgun houses to show that they can be successfully and, and correctly even rehabilitated and reused, but it doesn't have to cost a fortune and they can remain affordable. So it's natural affordable housing. Um, also other things related to our kind of equity and inclusion type initiatives. We have a, a heritage education program. Um, we're working with the San Antonio Independent School District, which is our largest school district on a cultural heritage curriculum that would be district wide. Um, that was approved by city council last year. Um, we've found through COVID, of course, that we can't, we have to do things virtual. And, um, and so that has kind of become a challenge and we've had to think about how to reach the community. There's a proposed historic district in the West side currently. This is a banner you see across the street in Spanish and English. We also did um, door hangers. We have a hotline that they can call and listen in Spanish or English to a pre-recorded presentation. They can leave and answer questions. So just really trying to think about how to reach people um, where they are and in a safe way. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to be a resource for the community. We, I, I strongly feel like we can't just tell people what to do. We need to, we need to um, be a resource for them. So we have a lot of it public education and outreach programming. Um, Bonnie mentioned in my intro, the STAR program, which is Students Together Achieving Revitalization. This was started in 2010. Um, through this program, we've worked on over 50 houses, actually 150 houses between this and the Rehabarama program. So um, it's been a great way for the community students to do kind of service learning and it helps the, um, the property owners really kind of arrest the deterioration in our historic districts. Um, Rehabarama is a similar model to STAR, but it's not limited to students and it's a one day event. Um, the first Rehabarama, we worked on 20 houses in a single day with, with about 18 contractors and 350 or so volunteers and did about $250,000 worth of improvements to those 20 houses. So you can do a lot in a day. Um, that was our crew one of the years, and it looks more like Chicago, how bo bundled up we all are, but that really did happen in San Antonio. Um, and there's one of our happy happy customers. Um, they were thrilled to, to see their house being loved. And the other thing that's so wonderful about programs like Rehabarama is you see neighbors come out and they get inspired by what's happening um, on their street and it, it's often contagious. Um, we do things like donuts and DIY, which is a Saturday morning, just like couple hour kind of thing, quick skills for people, ask questions. Um, one of are just run by our staff. Um, we have a historic homeowner fair that is a great resource with vendors and exhibitors, and then also demonstration um, for property owners. You see a lot of windows. We do a lot of window um, realtor training and certification. Another event that I'm really excited about is our Restored by Light event. As you probably know, we were um, our five Spanish missions were inscribed as a World Heritage Site in 2015, and um, the the missions, of course historically were very elaborately painted and now they look like they you see on the left. Um, and so one way that we that we chose to kind of educate the community is by restoring them um, through using projected technology. But the thing that was really wonderful about it is that thousands of people came out with their kids and their picnic baskets baskets. And it was a wonderful community event on every occasion that really brings people together, but also helps them learn more about their heritage and, and culture. Um, we do silly things too, like running and the amazing preservation race and adult version and a kid's version, any way to kind of reach somebody new or give somebody a different perspective about the history and culture of San Antonio. 
Um, this is a photo just kind of showing engagement with our elected officials. Um, every year we try to get them to highlight a, a resource in their district. Um, this is an important culturally significant theater in downtown that's, that's currently being rehabilitated. We're all very excited about that. Um, POP is the foundation that we started really to help just raise funds to do our hands-on work. Um, sometimes cities can be a little bureaucratic. And so having that partner helped us kind of get things funded a little bit more easily. So we raised money by having parties, the first one in a, in a power plant, hence the name Power Preservation Foundation. Then we had Mad Men, we had When Travel Was Glamorous, an airplane hangar, Rydell High Prom, uh, even the 80s. And all of this to raise money for the Kelso House Learning Lab, which you see um, in this photo. And the, so the Kelso House is the site where we work with College of Architecture students. We've had um, 40 or so students come through so far and they learn um, pr preservation principles, traditional building trades, and gain kind of real life experience with a, with a master craftsman um, who's seen in that photo on the left. And, um, and through this program with UTSA, we, we are developing a Living Heritage Trades Academy, which ultimately will include um, in-class training as well as um, on-the-job apprenticeship training to really um, per help to perpetuate those important traditional building methods that are part of, that are very much a part of our cultural heritage in San Antonio. Um, for, for over a decade, we've been hosting window workshops. This is pre-COVID, no worries. Um, that's why there are no masks, but um, people were very excited learning about how to rehab their um, the historic windows at the Kelso House. Um, we also are very much a part of the climate, uh, climate Heritage Network. Climate Heritage Network was formally launched last year and OHP is a, is a founding member. Um, we know that heritage really anchors social memory, informs identity, instills a sense of place, and all these things are essential in sustaining resilience. And so we are entering with POP and with a prominent architecture firm locally called Lake Flato into a partnership to do zero carbon certification from the International Living Future Institute for the Kelso House. Um, this will be the first project we believe in San Antonio uh, and um, for sure the first residential scale project. And really with an idea to demonstrating that uh, heritage buildings are an important part of our climate action strategies in the community. Um, we were one of the first cities in the country to have heritage as a component in our citywide climate action plan. So we're very happy about that. And it's just important that, you know, we feel like it's important that we're part of that, um, that conversation. We're also leading a deconstruction and salvage initiative. Um, deconstruction is, is tied to, of course, waste reduction and circular economy. We also feel very strongly that it's kind of like an organ donor concept. Um, we have a lot of historic buildings and um, we know some of them are gonna come down. I mean, demolition does happen, but when it, instead of demolishing and going to the landfill, if we deconstruct, then we can take that high quality old growth wood and put it into other houses and sustain the life of those resources. And so it really, and it also, um, increases the availability of, of that old growth wood and that higher quality material and therefore drives down prices because right now um, a lot of people don't have access to that reclaimed material. Um, and then finally, I think I have to wrap up. Um, we did recently a study uh, with Donovan Ripkema at Place Economics called Opportunity at Risk and this is Really, it was not about what just historic buildings. It was buildings built pre-1960, so any existing buildings, and just really looking at how, how important existing, older and existing buildings are to providing affordable housing. We know we can't build our way out of an affordable housing problem in our city, and so we have to reinvest in our existing buildings in order to, to make any progress in that arena. And that is it. I'm, I think I was exactly 20 minutes, so I'm going to stop and allow time for, um, for questions. But thanks again for having me.
Thank you so much, Shannon. And what great skill that you both have in being right on time. So we do have uh, 10, thanks to your uh, frugal nature with slides, we have 10 minutes for question and answer. And actually we've had several questions come in and I want to um, ask you both uh, so that you can you can speak some of these answers out loud so that everybody can hear that and that our uh, closed captioning can also cover these uh, these answers. So Sarah, the first question was to you and it was uh, from Mary Lou Seidel, who is with Preservation Chicago, our sister organization here in Chicago. And she was asking, you had made a comment about making sure that uh, that people of color are paid for their expertise. She asked if you were recommending that nonprofit board members be paid. Can you reiterate your response? Yeah, so so no, I, I wasn't talking about nonprofit board members. Um, primarily, I was talking about preservation boards, like at the city or, or county level, depending on where you are. Um, but I, I think, um, even though I think in most cases those are also volunteer positions, but you have the opportunity, I'm sure, to hire consultants. And so what I'm um, suggesting is that whenever there is an opportunity to hire a consultant um, of color who can help you improve your policies and practices around equity, I, I think that would be a great um, idea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And as we are trying to do, also paying your speakers is <laughs> it's an important step forward. So having stipends for your speakers, which we tried to make available as well. So it's about not being extractive, right, from, you know, not extracting people's expertise without recognizing that, uh, that expertise that uh, is valued, that has a value. Yeah, and I will just say that I think that a lot of people of color are asked to do things a lot. So, um, you know, and, 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 we, and I think all of us understand sometimes an organization has no money and maybe it is um, a beneficial to your time to give it um, willingly, you know, um, but it's just people also have bills to pay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. We're, we're doing a process of interviewing right now, interviewing a number of people and, uh, and offering stipends. So I just want to say thank you. That was actually influenced by your speech um, during uh, the Dismantle Preservation Conference recently. So thank you for that. Uh, I would like to move on. Shannon, there's a question for you with regard uh, to the, the scouts. SA team program. Uh, so this is from our board member, Jean Follett. So she asks, um, who, you know, who is part of the, the team that goes out to look at those demolition permits? Since you said you look at every demolition permit, do you include citizens who are not on the review board on that team? Yes. So it, it kind of depends on the situation. Like, Every permit that comes in, someone in OHP looks at. We do have a we ha we have one person who kind of straddles teams. She works partly with Scout SA and partly with um, our design review team, and so she does a lot of times the initial intake, and then we have people um, that do additional research if we think, I mean, sometimes we just know we can let something go, but if we think there might be something there, then then we do a, a, a more in-depth level of research. Um, we also have a system where we inform um, if it is something that's potentially historic in a, a, a kind of area that's eligible to be a historic district in a neighborhood conservation district in the area that the Westside Preservation Alliance is, is, is primarily working, um, then we do notification by email and we allow for a period of 30, the ordinance can, allows us to take up to 30 days. So we can allow time for the community to provide comment and either say, yes, we're concerned about it so that we could potentially move it forward for designation or which is even better from our perspective, I don't know if Sarah would agree, um, to have the community initiate it. You know, it's it's one thing for us to do it, but it's much better if, um, and we have, a, we have two or three right now that are getting ready to kind of at different points in the process where um, the, the neighborhood um, someone in the neighborhood or the neighborhood association has worked to um, do a request for a review of historic significance. So it's really, I, it's, it's almost never successful when it is just me and the property owner who wants to demolish their house standing in front of city council at the end of the day. Like it, it's so much better if, if there's voices from the community too. 
Thank you very much, Shannon. I, I also want to say there was a comment for you that we are in great awe that you have 20 staff members in your department. Um, it, that, that is an incredible accomplishment and we are envious here. In our I, state. Will, I will say one caveat is that four of those people are full-time vacant buildings program, which I would have loved to have talked to you about. That is related to historic properties. I mean, every all historic districts are subject to the vacant building program, but it also goes beyond just historic proper properties. So those four positions are, are not traditional municipal preservation office positions, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, if we get to it, Shannon, there was a question about the vacant building program, but let's hold off and get to some of the other questions. Thank you, everybody, for putting your questions in. I'm going to try to get to as many as possible. Uh, so, Sarah, I want to I want to pose one to you. We actually have um, one of our attendees and somebody very close to us at uh, at Landmarks Illinois, a board member who was born in San Antonio and actually um, baptized uh, at one of the local missions. So she's loving this. She said she's crying watching this presentation, uh, but she just was asking, you know, have have you or you know Shannon, you as well considered looking at sites outside of Bexar County? Um, uh, there is a schoolhouse on uh, by her, you know, her community in Pipe Creek uh, that, um, and she said, I believe UTSA is watching over it. So um, how are you thinking about things outside of San Antonio? I, I think, uh, and Shannon can chime in on this, but I think um, Preservation Texas, which I think is sort of like maybe Landmarks Illinois, I'm not sure, I don't know, uh, but Preservation Texas sends out a lot of information about um, sites around the state. And so um, that's one group that she might wanna be in touch with. Um, and then uh, certainly for Latinos and Heritage Conservation, uh, we're always interested in learning about sites wherever they may be in the US, including of course, Puerto Rico, um, that may be threatened or that may uh, maybe uh, people on the ground would like help um, getting designated or, or finding other resources for. Well, and I, I would say too, I mean, obviously as part of this, as a city employee, we don't have any jurisdiction outside of the, the city limits of San Antonio, but um, the Conservation Society of San Antonio, which is of course a longstanding well-known organization, they do work outside of the city limits. So they, they really, um, their mission extends to the region. So that may be another good resource. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for mentioning our partners. Uh, indeed, Preservation Texas is our sister organization and, uh, and our very own Vince Michael, our past uh, board member and staff member runs the San Antonio Conservation uh, Society. So um, once again, connections with Chicago. Um, you know, we had an early question that uh, Shannon related to your presentation about shotguns and the work on shotguns. You had mentioned that they're not only uh, really environmentally sustainable, but they're culturally sustainable. And there was a question, what do you mean by culturally sustainable? Well, I think, you know, just because they're they are so they are so kind of steeped in culture and tradition and vernacular architecture and so it it is more about the the cultural significance associated with that housing type and mm -hmm. um, how the the neighborhoods developed and how and the kinds of people who built and lived in them that it it they tell a story that is that is very much a part of our cultural history mm -hmm. thank you thank you for that um, there's, uh, Sarah, did you want to say something? Uh, no, but I mean, I, I just think that across the South where you, you see um, shotguns, you know, that, that wherever you see shotguns, that was a working class neighborhood, right? And so um, I'm not just interested in, in the preservation of Mexican American or Latino communities, but I'm also very interested in the preservation of working class communities and working class um, uh, design. And, I, and so to me, Shotguns are, are so important to tell that story of the people who built this country. Mm -hmm. I, and I, you know, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I think that's exactly our, our push, but it's also, you know, there's such this kind of the tiny house craze and some of those kinds of things. And I just think that shotguns are a way that we can communicate to people. Like, look at this. We, we already have this, this, structure that is adorable and is kind of by definition affordable because of the size of it. And so, you know, it, it it's a way to educate people, I think, about about the value and at, while at the same time tell the story of why why we even have them 
and the kind and the neighbor the, the people that built them. Thank you both. Uh, I see we're, we're um, just at four o'clock. So I do want to um, offer to those who need to step off at this time, we are recording this, we will post it, which includes this Q&A portion. So I'm going to ask our speakers if they can stay for a couple more minutes. Uh, you don't have to, but if you have time, we have more questions. Are you willing? Sure. Okay, so we'll keep the presentation going. If you can stay, wonderful. Otherwise, We'll be posting this um, in our different venues uh, at Landmarks Illinois. So let's keep going. Shannon, there's some questions about that salvage and demolition ordinance and about who pays for salvage and, uh, and demolition. Is it the developer, uh, the person who's using the salvage material, the city? Who, it uh, who pays? Um, so, so the ordinance is actually a draft. So we don't have an adopted ordinance at this point because of COVID. Um, we were basically starting the the approval process when um, when the sh kind of shutdown began, and um, but the the what's recommended and what the general uh, agreement is among um, community members is that we would start with with how with residential structures that are built pre 1920, and that gives us a manageable number of demolitions to begin. And yes, the cost of that would be borne by the owner or the demolition contractor. Um, but there is no mandate in terms of where the materials can go. We are working actively on developing a local marketplace for those materials. Um, we worked with a, a technology, our Office of Sustainability at the city to build a, um, a marketplace online, sort of a dating app for building materials. And, um, and so the idea is that we would help them match those materials with people who need them. And that by selling those materials that it would offset the increased costs. Um, mostly um, it is right now, it would cost uh, you know, a couple of thousand dollars more for a small house to be deconstructed rather than demolished. But there is value in that material that can then be, that can then be sold. So um, we believe that ultimately there is enough of a market that it wouldn't, that the cost could be offset. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. I was, I was just going to um, note that while yours is um, in draft form, that if people want to turn to one that is just been in put in place, uh, the city of Portland yes. has a, a deconstruction ordinance that has uh, virtually stopped demolitions, in fact. So it's a very interesting case study. And, and we very much modeled, I mean, we looked to Portland, we held a, a deconstruction think tank where we brought people in from a couple kind of reused retail side people and then also municipal people. Um, and Portland, of course, is a great example um, because they're further along than we are. But, you know, what's interesting about ours that we're um, kind of excited about is that it really is, has been developed through a preservation lens. Um, in Portland, nobody really thought about it as, as mm -hmm. an, the cultural heritage aspect of it. But we really believe that there's cultural value in those materials. And if, you know, if every house doesn't, can't be saved, at least we can kind of breathe new life into other ones with, with the material that comes out of them. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Shannon. I want to uh, send another one your way since it's very much based on um, the city process. And then Sarah, I'm gonna, I have another one for you. Um, so we have a member of ours, Milani. I think this is Milani Eckner. Um, so when a demolition permit comes to the Office of Historic Preservation and a potential landmark is spotted in the building, what steps are undertaken to shift the trajectory from demolition to preservation? So the way the process works, we only have 30 days and um, to, to decide to whether or not we're going to initiate. And so, you know, maybe during that time, we'll, we'll receive an application from the community um, to do a third party request, or maybe um, we as staff will refer it to the commission. Um, so we can take it to the commission and kind of do a site visit and let them assess. And if it seems like the commission is, is, is willing to support, then we, we take a finding of historic significance to them. If they issue that finding, then we have to go to city council because in Texas, you can't initiate a rezoning. The only two people who can initiate a rezoning is the owner of the building or the city council. And so we can't, we can't do that. And so we take a finding of historic significance to city council and we, you know, we tell them and we ask them to direct us to initiate the rezoning process or the landmark designation process. And so then we have to come back to HDRC because based on a relatively recent change in state law, 
the, com the commission and the zoning commission have to make a recommendation on a proposal to designate. And so on the actual zoning request. So it goes to the commission twice. And then, and that, because of this new state law, has to have a supermajority vote at either HGRC or the zoning commission. And then, um, this is all if the owner is opposed. We don't have to do that, that extra step to city council if the owner is willing to sign the application. Then it goes to zoning, then it goes back to council. And then council, of course, is the ultimate say on whether or not something is zoned or designated historic. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the, it's, it's definitely an, a much higher bar because of the state law. Um, also included in that state law, unfortunately, is that we cannot designate anything owned by a religious entity without their permission. So we can't designate, you know, churches or or even the parish parish house or something, you know, like anything that that is owned by a religious entity. And if I if I could just comment on that, because that that state law was just so upsetting when it got passed, and it, in my mind, my opinion, was put forth by a misunderstanding of what historic preservation is. Mm -hmm. And it was put forth with this, under, this misunderstanding that it would take in particular um, African-American churches right to sell away from them or, or something like that. It, but it made no sense. And it really, it just really revealed a lack of understanding of what historic preservation is. And unfortunately, it has making it that much harder to preserve spaces connected to people of color. Because when you go to the preservation board, what I have experienced, and I know others have too, is that the preservation board members often do not understand the significance of your shabby little building that means a lot to the community, but looks like a so-called eyesore. And, and so it has just made it that much harder. And this is absolutely not about taking people's property rights away. Yeah. But it is about the community being able to protect itself against developers. That's really what it's about. Well, and so, it's, oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say, I'm agreeing with you. Like the other thing that makes it so much harder is that uh, it's a super majority of, of the positions. So even if we don't have a full commission, it requires nine of 11 votes. Mm -hmm. And so we almost never have a full commission. And right now we're down one, like we have a vacancy. And I can't even tell you the last time I saw Tom, all 10 of them on the same day. So mm -hmm. like, it is very hard to even get enough people in the room to give you a supermajority vote. So we like we fought, obviously we fought it, but we one of the things that we really advocated for is changing the language to at least say that it was a supermajority of those present, but we weren't successful. Hmm. Well, let's, um, so we could all share horror stories of local law, you know, ordinance, state laws and local ordinances. Um, so we appreciate that. And um, the, let's, we did tap into, I think with that last question, the one of the questions we received about equity is social equity and uh, preservation programs related to social equity. So Sarah, this is your presentation really delved into this. So I wanted to pose that question to you. This is from our um, Richard Friedman, uh, uh, one of our preservation attorneys and board members. Um, what is the development community's attitude to, oh, sorry, that one's separate. Pardon me, everybody. Um, you know, so we had a question uh, about uh, programs that are looking to put in place uh, for social equity. The other one was about the 30 day demo delay, Shannon, and how people mm -hmm. feel about that. So you can talk about both well, or either. I, I just wanna say two things that have happened under Shannon's tenure that I think are very good. Um, one is that we got a, a change in our local rules so that new historic districts can get tax freezes. And Shannon, I don't know if you wanna talk about the details of that, but that is really helpful because a lot of our, um, particularly our older folks, um, uh, like aging baby boomers and, and, and uh, above, they own their properties and they may have a lot of deferred maintenance, but they own them. And those, these are properties that are now over 50 years old, so they are qualified. Um, and so if, because we know the gentrification is coming, whatever, whatever we want to do to try to stop it, it's coming. And so I really do feel that by changing that rule and, and helping people out with that little tax break, 
It is going to help us better protect people in their homes and prevent displacement. I know oftentimes people think that historic districts cause displacement. And I actually worried about that before this new rule came into play. But I think when this rule came into play, and it's been a few years now, but it, I think it really opened up the possibility, the potential for working class historic districts, um, which is fantastic. The other thing is that I really do think it is important that cities allow third party applications for historic designations. So San Antonio offers that. And yes, it puts a lot of onus on those of us who have other day jobs and don't necessarily wanna spend our Saturdays at the library doing that research, but at least we're allowed to do it. And um, you know that's something that I, I'm, I'm so happy that we have that ability. So in terms of equity, unfortunately right now, oftentimes the onus does fall on us to do that work, but at least because the policy allows us to submit those third party applications, um, you know, that it opens a door. So I would love to see all cities allow third party applications and not put some high dollar application fee on it. Because if you make it a 300, 400, $500 application fee, we can't afford that, right? Um, so we're really fortunate here that it's free, um, but um, I, I think other people, other cities should be thinking about that too. Yeah, and I, I think to expand a little bit on what Sarah said, um, in addition to it being free, we also have a, a lower reason, like threshold requirement for the statements of significance than a lot of cities. I mean, I, there are a lot of places that we've researched that you, you basically have to write the level of a national register nomination practically for local designation. And, and while ours do require that you demonstrate how it meets the criteria, it's, it, it is an easier bar to reach than a lot of other communities. Well, thank you both. Uh, you know, we, we have, um, you know, a few more questions that have come up, but we're making our way through them. We'll try to get through them as quickly as possible since we are at 12 after and you've been wonderful. Um, just some comments that, that you know, they wanna thank you very much for your detailed answers about this process. Uh, I, others feel your pain, so they wanna say feel your pain. Um, Shannon, there was a question here from actually from Ed Torres, who's a, um, with Latinos and Heritage Conservation. So do you think a local landmark strategy or movement to include a criteria for cultural heritage could be a part of a national preservation strategy uh, to demonstrate to the Park Service um, that you know, this should be included in the designation process. So again, this is related to cultural heritage as part of a national strategy. I mean, I personally think so. Like, I don't, you don't even wanna get me on my soapbox about the disconnect between, you know, it's just like so many times when we get to the level of national, the national level and particularly like looking at tax credit projects and things like that. Um, it's just, it's crazy to me that we get so hung up on whether or not we're gonna punch an additional few windows in a wall of a building that wasn't designated for architecture in the first place. Like if it's culturally significant, isn't it just more important that we're reusing it and we're maintaining that connection to history and you know maybe it's okay that some things have been modified. And so, you know, I absolutely do think that the local kind of examples in local communities that are more inclusive and allowing for more types of designations um, will inform. And, and honestly, that was, that was one of the motivations that um, Ken Bernstein in LA and I had in informing the big cities um, network that Bonnie mentioned in my intro is to really kind of, you know, look at what's happening in other communities and how maybe we can get together and, and try to change either the standards themselves or the way that we're applying them in some cases. Mm -hmm. uh, Shannon, I mentioned briefly, excuse me, conflating two questions, but there was a question about the, you know, the 30 day demo delay as a tactic and, and how the or how the developer community considers that. Um, and there are two more and then we're, we're finished. So um, one is about the vacant building program. If you want to summarize that quickly okay. and then, um, so why don't we go with those two? And then there's just one more question. So honestly, the 30 day thing, we don't get a whole lot of pushback on that. I mean, once in a while, you'll get a, an inexperienced developer or somebody kind of somebody from out of town or whatever, who'll kind of call my staff every two days and say, where's my permit? But for the most part, it it's 30 days. It's not the end of the world. And, and 
that's not, I mean, it's also important to remember that the vast majority of demolition permits that come through the office are like, you know, 1980s gas stations out in the, in loop land. Like we're not, we're not holding all of them. And so um, it's just, it's just a tool to make sure, you know, demolition, you can't take back. So it's a tool to make sure that we're at least being mindful be, about those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the vacant building program, it, the vacant building program was launched in 2015. And at the time, it the pilot program was uh, local historic districts, all local and in individual landmarks, um, and the downtown central business district, and then a half mile buffer around active military bases. Um, it was very, you know, a lot of Air Force personnel come through San Antonio, particularly the Lackland, and it was important to um, some of our council members that we deal with some of the vacant buildings in those areas because that's the, the, the face that we're presenting to a lot of people who come to visit our city. And so we started there and basically what the, what the ordinance requires is, of course, it's okay if you want to have a vacant building, but the idea is that your vacant building can't pull down the property values or shouldn't pull down the property values of others around you. I always compare it to a, a smoking ordinance, like a smoking ban. You know, like you can still smoke if you want to, but you have to do it somewhere where you're not, like other people aren't breathing it in. And um, so the uh, a property owner of a vacant property has to register if the property has been vacant for more than 30 days. And the onus is on up to us to identify it. So we have to document that it's been vacant. And then um, they have to come into compliance with a standard of care. And the standard of care is basically like if it, it, it has to look like you could rent it or lease it or sell it or occupy it. Um, the windows have to be repaired. The doors can't be boarded up. The roof has to be in good repair. So it just has to be generally presentable on the exterior envelope. Um, beyond that, it's up to the owner. Um, there are a lot of exemptions in the program. Um, if somebody's actively marketing the property, um, if there's been some sort of a disaster, if there's active permits on the property, there are a lot of ways that um, someone might not have to pay the registration fee or might get an extension before their subject. Um, but that's the basic concept. And, and we know, and the program has since expanded. It was very successful, the pilot. And so it's since, since expanded um, to a buffer around all of the historic districts and the central business district, um, neighborhood conservation districts, and, and a few other program areas. And, um, and we know of, you know, several hundred at this point, se six or 700 properties at this point that have, uh, have come into compliance and are no longer subject to the vacant building ordinance because they've, they've been brought, put back into active use. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Now, um, so our last question, Sarah, thank you for uh, working to answer that. It was about the CONSAPO program, uh, which um, if, if there's any either of you who want to explain it, the question was, is the CONSAPO program still going in San Antonio? Can you explain it and how it worked? And that is our last question. Do either of you want to cover that? So, so we did an initiative, um, several, I, I mean, I think this is what the question is about. We did an initiative several years ago that was kind of just part of a kind of living heritage and, um, and helping to identify, you know, like when the trust used to do This Place Matters and when like people, some organizations do like heart bombs and things like that. Well, in San Antonio, there was this thing when you were a kid, you would like write on your paper, like, you know, I love so-and-so. Um, there was a symbol that was like C slash S and it was consapos. And so we sort of used that as a way to say, like, I love this place, like kind of put your stamp on it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really active anymore, but it certainly could be, you know, it's still something that is, is just kind of a fun way, again, to make people think of place a little differently than they might have before or um, kind of connect to, to the history and culture. Mm -hmm. That is a fitting ending um, because we're all trying to connect with our history and our culture. And this has been a, an informative and rich discussion with both of you. So I'm just again, on behalf of our board, our staff and our attendees, I would like to thank Sarah Zanita Gould so much for being here and Shannon Shea Miller for 
their time and their expertise in sharing with us. Um, let me just ask you quickly, if people want to get a hold of you, Shannon, you had your contact information. Since this is recorded, you will see the presentations. Sarah, do you have your contact information? Do you want it to be shared? Yeah, I'm sorry. Of course, a cat had to jump in my lap right then. Um, uh, yeah, I, I can put it in the chat if that works. I don't know. Um, Yes, yes, you can put it in the chat, uh, or if people have questions, they can also reach out to us individually, and we can provide whatever email address you would like us to. Uh, so I would like to say thank you to everybody for staying on with us, and um, one final thank you to Annabelle Fernandez, who, who has been typing furiously in our closed captioning, and she has done an amazing job at keeping up with this live, uh, live speaking. Um, so everybody, we appreciate it and we look forward to seeing you at future Snapshots lectures and have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Annabelle, thank you.